Web applications these days are becoming more and more concurrent. Lots of things can happen at once, often independently. This makes it easier to scale certain parts of your application as traffic increases, but it also comes with a serious amount of overhead and a lot of added complexity. However, if you're working with a platform designed for concurrency, concurrency becomes easier and sometimes trivial. The Erlang Beam VM is one such platform, and Gleam is a new statically typed language that can take full advantage of the Beam's capabilities. This video is a guide to using concurrency to create scalable, fault-tolerant applications in Gleam using the Beam VM and Erlang OTP. If you don't already know Gleam, pause this, go and watch my Gleam for Impatient Devs video and come back. It'll give you enough of a foundation to follow along. All good? Then let us go. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of Gleam concurrency, it's important to understand how the Erlang Beam VM works. Every Beam program is comprised one or more processes. A process is a concurrent unit of execution. Processes are incredibly lightweight and it's not uncommon to see programs running thousands of them at once on a single machine. Other languages might refer to processes as green threads or coroutines, but it's important to understand that each Beam process has its own memory and cannot share memory with other processes. This avoids the need for a lot of the concurrency primitives you see in other languages, like mutexes and semaphores around shared memory. Instead, every process has what's called a mailbox, into which other processes can send messages. Each process has a process ID, known as a PID or PID, which acts as the inbound address for these messages. Messages in a mailbox can only be accessed by the process that owns the mailbox. These features, along with the Beam's immutable, functional design, make it much easier to distribute your application across multiple cores and machines than in other languages. To use Beam concurrency in Gleam, you're going to need to install the Gleam Erlang and the Gleam OTP libraries using the Gleam add command. To get the PID of the current process, use the process.self function from Gleam Erlang's process module. If you'd like to create a new process, call process.start with two arguments. The first is a function to run in a new process, and the second is a boolean indicating whether the new process should be linked to the current process. If two processes are linked, they will fail together, meaning that if either crashes, so will the other. This function will return the PID of the new process. Processes are the lowest level concurrency primitive in Gleam, and you probably won't use them often, but it's important to understand how they work. But so far, our spawned processes will run a function and return, but we won't be able to see the output. In Erlang or Elixir, you can send messages directly to a mailbox using the PID. However, in Gleam, we use an abstraction called a subject. Subjects give us slightly more power than raw message passing, as subjects are generic over the contained message. This allows us to pass messages in a type-safe way. Furthermore, we can have multiple subjects per process and read from each at different times, meaning we don't always have to read mailbox messages in a first-in, first-out order. Use process.newSubject to create a subject belonging to the current process. We can then use process.send to send messages to this subject from another process. Read from the subject using process.receive, which also takes a timeout value in milliseconds. If there are no messages found in the mailbox within the timeout, this will return an error result. If we create a second subject, you'll see that not only can we send a different type of message to it, but we can also read from the two subjects in any order we like and don't have to worry about the order in which messages were sent. But what if you do care about the order in which things were sent, but you still want to receive multiple types of message? Well, for that, you can use what's called a selector. A selector will listen to multiple subjects at once, returning the first message that arrives. However, the catch is that the selector can only output a single type. So while you can listen to the subjects with different types, the messages will all have to be transformed into the same type on read. Create a new selector using process.newSelector. You can then add subjects to this selector using process.selecting, passing in a transformation function for the message type. For example, here we have a subject that accepts strings and another that accepts integers. For the string subject, we don't want to do any transformations, so we'll use function.identity, which just returns the value passed in. For the integer subject, we'll use int.toString from the standard library to turn the value into a string first. We can then read from our selector using process.select with the timeout value and we'll receive messages in the order they're passed in. Now, we're going to depart from subject for a second to talk about tasks. Tasks are effectively single-use processes that execute a function and return its result. While you could technically achieve this using processes and subjects, tasks provide some convenience wrappers that make handling errors a little easier and save you from having to manually set up a load of subjects. You'll normally use a task to run sequential code concurrently. Since you can use any sequential function in a task, Gleam avoids the problem of function coloring so your async code doesn't have to spread to your entire application. Create a task by calling the task.async function from the Gleam OTP library. This takes in a single argument, the function you'd like to call, and returns a task, which is generic over the return type of the aforementioned function. You can then do some other work in the background, and when you need the result from the task, you can call task.await with the task and a timeout value in milliseconds. However, if the task you're awaiting 
doesn't return within the timeout, the calling process will panic and crash. You can avoid this in a few ways. Task.await forever will wait indefinitely for the task to finish, but this could block the calling process forever, which is rarely what you'll need. Task.tryAwait takes a task and a timeout value and returns a result. The result will either contain the task's return value or an await error if the task timed out. All of these functions will panic if the task process panics. However, if the task process exits without returning or in some other way, like via the process.exit function, only await and await forever will panic. Try await will return an error in this case. There's also the try await forever function that acts like try await but waits indefinitely, returning a result when the task process exits. If you want to be able to gracefully handle panics in your code, you can use what's called a supervisor, which we'll get into shortly. One common pattern for tasks is the fan out, fan in pattern, where you spawn a number of tasks to perform some computation in parallel, then immediately wait for them all to finish. You might use this to make a load of API calls, for example. And actually, I have a task for you to subscribe to my channel, of course, and maybe hit that bell icon. I'll try a wait for you to be done. If you want to be able to communicate with another process while it's running, you'll probably want to reach for an actor. Gleam's actors are like Erlang or Elixir's gen servers and are usually used to hold a mutable state, execute code, or communicate with other processes by sending or receiving messages. Essentially, actors will hold some state, wait for a message to come into their mailbox, and then run a custom function in a loop to handle that message. The first thing you'll want to do when working with actors is to define the type of message you'd like the actor to receive. If the actor only has a single function, you could use a scalar value like a a string or an int. However, you'll usually want to interact with your actor in different ways, like both setting and getting state, so it's common practice to define a message type with multiple constructors. For example, let's say we wanted our actor to hold a stack of items. We'd probably want a push message that adds an item to the stack and a pop message for removing items. It's also good practice to add a shutdown variant so we can tell the actor to stop. We'll go into the pop message shortly, but the push messages constructor just takes in the item we want to add. Next, we need to define the function the actor will run when it receives a message, otherwise known as the message handler function. This takes the actor's current state as the first argument and the received message as the second. It returns a special type called actor.next, which tells the actor how to behave once the message has been handled. Here, if we receive a push message, we'll add the item to our stack and use actor.continue to tell the actor to carry on receiving messages. As you can see, actor.continue takes the new state of the actor. Once we've created our actor, which we'll do later, we'll be able to send it a push message using the actor.send function using the actor subject, which returns nil. If we go back to our pop message constructor, we'll see that it takes a subject as its only argument. This subject can be used to send values back to the calling process's mailbox and allows us to get values out of the actor. In the handler, we construct our response by checking the list for values. If there's at least one value present, our response is an OK result with that value. Otherwise, it's an error nil. We can then send that back to the calling process using actor.send using the subject we were sent in the pop message. Once again, we simply tell the actor to continue with the new state. In order to pop a message from another function, we use actor.call with the pop constructor. Under the hood, this creates a new subject using process.newSubject and calls whatever function you pass to actor.call with that subject, waits for a value in that subject, and returns it. There's some extra error handling, but that's pretty much all the actor.call function does, and you could easily replicate it yourself. If we had a message that required multiple items, for example, pop many, we'd use the function capture syntax to create a new constructor function that only takes the subject. We could then pass other arguments to our constructor, like how many items we want to pop. Finally, if we get a shutdown message, we'll return an actor.stop value with our exit reason. In this case, that's a process.normal, signifying that it's an expected exit. To start our actor, we simply call actor.start with our initial state and the handler function. This will return a result containing the actor's subject and a start error. In the case of actor.start, this will always be the OK variant. As a side note, you'd usually abstract away a lot of the complexity around starting, calling, and shutting down your actor in a separate module. That way, you Users of your code don't need to know the details of your actor. If you want a little more control over your actors, you have a couple of options. The first is the actor.start spec function, which creates a new actor using a spec value. Instead of defining the initial state as a value, a spec allows you to specify an init function for your actor, which returns an init result, with the initial state and the selector using which the actor will receive its messages. This allows you to use multiple subjects to send messages to your actor if you need that. If the init result returned is the failed variant, start spec will return an error. If you want to change 
change the selector in use while the actor is running, you can return the result of actor.withSelector from the message handler function. This takes an actor.next like before, along with a new selector that the actor will use to handle messages going forward. You might use this if you want to discard all pending messages and start again with a fresh subject. The problem with actors is that if they crash, you don't really know, and you might end up trying to get a value from an actor that no longer exists. And that's exactly the role of supervisors. A supervisor is effectively a process that looks after one or more other processes and is responsible for starting, stopping, restarting, or killing them. Most OTP applications will be structured as something called a supervision tree, where you have worker nodes and supervisor nodes. The worker nodes are usually your actors, which do all the work in the program. These are the leaves of the tree. Supervisors are parents to other workers, and workers can also be supervisors, creating a multi-layered supervision tree. The idea is that if one part of your program breaks, the supervisor responsible for that part of the program can restart it. If that supervisor can't restart its child for whatever reason, it will kill its other children and then itself, passing the problem up to the parent supervisor. This behavior will continue until the broken part of the program is successfully restarted or the whole program crashes. The hope is that you can effectively isolate just the broken part of the tree and do the classic technician move of turn it off and on again. This way, you can avoid transient concurrency bugs that are hard to reproduce by just killing them without killing your entire system. I've made a simple actor that takes one message and has a 10% chance of panicking when it receives it. This is to simulate an actor that can occasionally enter an unrecoverable state. Since we're not going to be creating this actor directly and we want to be able to send messages to it later, we'll create a wrapper around the start spec function that allows us to pass a parent subject to the actor. The actor will then use this to send its own subject back up to the parent for later messaging. This seems like a bit of a hacky workaround, but it's a common design pattern for working with supervisors. As I mentioned, there are two types of supervisor children, workers and other supervisors. We can turn our actor into a worker by calling the supervisor.worker function from Gleam OTP. This takes in a function to start the actor and returns a supervisor.child spec value. The supervisor.add function takes the supervisor's current children and a new child to add. We can use this in a function capture with supervisor.start, which will then start our supervisor, returning a result with the supervisor's subject. If you want to add multiple children at once, you can create an anonymous function and chain together add calls within it, passing that to supervisor.start. By default, a supervisor will start each child at most once every five seconds. You can adjust this using the supervisor.start spec function with a supervisor.spec value. More information on this can be found in the Glean docs. However, now that we've got this set up, we can send our supervised actor some messages. We'll use a recursive function to send it 100 messages. The process.tryCall function will send a message to our actor, returning an error if the process has crashed or doesn't respond within the specified timeout. If this errors, then our process has crashed and the supervisor has started a new one. In this case, the process will have a new PID and therefore a new subject. However, thanks to the init function we wrote, the actor will send this back up to our parent subject so we can carry on with a new subject. We'll also print out every time we crash and on which iteration we crashed so we have something to see. Once we've played our game 100 times, we'll return the subject of the currently alive actor. If we run this, we'll see we get a few crashes and if we print the PIDs of both the initial actor and the final one, we should see that they're different. This means that the supervisor successfully restarted our actor when it crashed. Amazing. So, in summary, use tasks for parallelizing functions, actors for processes you want to communicate with, and supervisors to manage your actors. If you're interested in learning more, check out the docs for Gleam Erlang and Gleam OTP. I'd also recommend having a look at this GitHub repo, which teaches you OTP concurrency using Gleam. It was really helpful for me when I put together this video, and it's a great reference, so go and give it a start. It's also worth noting this video is only focused on Gleam's Erlang target. If you're compiling to JavaScript, you'll need to use the Gleam JavaScript library and promises. In the meantime, why not take a look at this video, where I walk through a project that uses all these concepts to create a backend web server in Gleam.